What's up, guys? I'm Steven. And I'm Will. And this, this is the, the Post P Chronicles. Chronicles. So what's up, Will? What do we got today? Uh, we have a great guest for you today, a great woman, Roxana Lopez, better known as Roxy. Hello. What's going on, Roxy? I'm a little nervous. Oh, uh, man, don't be nervous. You know, say we just talking. That's all. So, uh, you know, as I say all the time, tell us your story. Hello, my name is Roxana. Um, I, my story comes from my childhood. I was incarcerated for three years. I got involved in bad stuff. Well, let's let's start like this. Yes, why don't you was, ask me how was first? Your, how was your upbringing? My upbringing was it like? Were you from San Diego? Where are you I'm from? I'm from Fresno, California. My oh. upbringing was just to. My dad had three restaurants, so we were raised to work. Mm-hmm. So at the age of ten, I always had to be ready Saturdays and Sundays to go work. So my upbringing wasn't all about education. It was about to be working at the restaurant business, and that's how I was raised. Um, I was a spoiled, rotten brat. Always got what I wanted, but I was very rebellious. And I had a good life growing up, very spoiled, had everything I wanted, but I liked the chaos. I liked the streets. So I made those wrong choices. So You said you were had a spoiled life, a good life. Yes. Now, does that equal mean you had a good loving family, great structure, or what is what is what was your home life like? No. I knew if I would get my dad mad. I would get something very nice the next day. There was no structure in my home. Mm-hmm. My dad was a very, he was a big time alcoholic. And my mom was a perfect woman. She never drank. She just bowed down to my dad. So I had a little anger towards my mom because I would get mad how my dad would treat her. So that's where I think I got my anger towards men to see how my mom was treated. So that's why I'm very like aggressive and I have a wall and I treat men the way I treat them. So my upbringing wasn't really good. Okay, so you said you fell in love with the streets, or you you liked the chaos. So how did that start to manifest, or when did that start to manifest? When I walked in on my dad and I saw him doing something, so I was curious, and I started doing drugs at the age of 15. If you don't mind me asking, what was the something that you saw? He was doing a line of cocaine on a sword in the office at the restaurant. So I'll, I used to think of my dad very highly, so I always wanted to be like my dad, so that's why I chose. I was trying to be like him and just follow his footsteps, so I started using drugs at 15. Now, did he know you were using drugs? Was it like, I want to be like, Dad, Dad, let me do what you're doing? They didn't it... believe me when I tried to tell him because I was really hooked on Back then it was crank, mm-hmm. and they didn't believe me. I was really doing it really bad, and I just knew I needed help, and they didn't. Believe me, they thought I was lying for attention. Mm, how did that feel? So you actually went to your parents to reach out for help, saying, I have an addiction. Because mm-hmm, um, I was doing really, like, crazy, like, chaotic stuff. And they wanted to know what was going on. And I told them, and they were like, you're just lying for attention. I don't know why you're doing this. You get everything you want. But I really didn't. I didn't get love. Mm. So what I'm hearing is you can give your kid everything in the world but if you don't give them love you're not giving them enough now is that kind of all you wanted growing up probably said wealthy spoiled rotten got everything you wanted it's not what i wanted i wanted wanted love from both parents or just your dad specifically from both parents and their version of loving you was Was buying me what you want yeah and as long as i worked at the restaurant i didn't get they didn't tell me i had to be in school they didn't tell me how to go to college i had dreams and goals i wanted to go to college i wanted to be a probation officer Instead, I got one. <laughs> but they weren't hard on us about school or anything. They were just more hard on the business. Right. But they didn't realize that business, sometimes they fail. They don't last forever. So that's what happened to them. And what happened to me, I didn't have no education. So I just decided to just leave home and end up with my kid's dad at a young age. Okay. And I got involved in another toxic relationship. First was my dad living at home, and then my kid's dad also. So you said 15, you started doing drugs. Mm-hmm. We in Fresno. Mm, it know, was called Crank. Crank. We 15, you started doing Crank. Yeah. You got hooked on Crank, and you said it just led to you doing a lot of destructive things. What kind of destructive things were you into? 
um, shooting at my ex-boyfriend's house because he was cheating, um, fighting, doing just like breaking things, right. um, running my cars into girls that try to fight me, getting in fights. Man, okay. So you said that you was hooked in the streets. Like, did you join any gang? Was you part of any gang? Like, what did that look like? I'd rather not say if I joined a gang. No problem. But I was involved with a lot of gangs. Okay. No problem. So, I went to college in Fresno. I know Fresno. Fresno State. See, they made yeah. the Bulldogs. I'm not just kidding. Yeah, no, actually, I went to Fresno Pacific. So the east oh, side. I remember yeah. Fresno Pacific. My dad's restaurant was right next to Fresno yeah, yeah. Pacific. Yeah, so I grew up on the... I grew up going to the east side, which is Fresno Pacific. So, I'm very familiar with the area of Fresno. And I know how that could be. So, you go from your parents' house to now you're going into obviously entering a relationship with your boyfriend and are you still addicted to drugs at this point no i i'm not gonna sit here and lie if on um, during covid i kind of backslid a little mm-hmm. and but, me when i go into that lifestyle i know where my life will end up because yeah. i know what i'm capable of doing so i had to get myself together because but covid kind of almost broke break, broke me and that's why i did two shows during covid so see, let me fast forward and pretty far because you know you said you're still in fresno this so this is way before covid you know so what is what's going on in your life you obviously say you're shooting at people you're running people over you're doing a lot you're doing a lot of crazy things but how did you get to san diego like what's going on um when i went when i got charged i was looking at 14 years and i they dropped it down to five years with half so when I got in prison, I knew that I had to do something because if you do good behavior, you could do your half time. And when I was paroling, I was sent to um, Bakersfield to a program, a prison program, and I didn't want to come back. I didn't want to go back to Fresno because I knew I had 14 years and I was going back to nothing. And I knew what I was going to do. Right. I already knew. And I called my mom and dad if I could parole over here in San Diego. So I came over here and... I had did some horrible things to my parents when I was on my addiction, doing my crimes, and they let me in. And I'm blessed for that because if it wasn't for them, who knows where I would be right now. Because when you get released, sometimes people don't have family. There's not a lot of programs you could get help from. And I was blessed having my parents after everything I did to them. So that's what made me, and I made a promise that I was never going back because that's not a nice place to be. All right. So you said you looking at the time what did you go to jail for well that wasn't my first time going to jail i actually did county jail okay and i did a program and i was doing so good and i got my job back at the irs they forgave me after what i had on my um record and i got involved with the wrong people again i had got a house and everything and i got out of the program home and i felt i fail again because i just and it's funny because i went to church and a pastor told me that if I didn't straighten up again, I was going to go back somewhere worse. And I think I was interested about that. Mm. So I just didn't care no more. And I just picked up cases and charges and charges and charges. And I ended up going to prison. Was drugs a major factor in all the crimes that you committed? Do you think so? No, the adrenaline rush. The adrenaline rush. The crimes, what I was capable of doing. Right. I mean, I like to do drugs. I did. But... More, it was just the crimes. So you said the adrenaline rush. Um, the adrenaline rush and the excitement, was it because also the attention you got for it? Because yes. you didn't get How the did attention you know from that? your parents, right? So it all they were kind trying of looking for me. Right? Yeah. So you, I mean, it wasn't positive attention, but it was attention nonetheless. So the adrenaline rush, the attention, you started doing crimes, and you're, I guess, in your mind, getting something or trying to fill a void you never had filled, correct? Yes. Yeah. So. Then let me ask you, I mean, we're going to fast forward just a little bit, you know, go to the overall big picture. What's your key to staying sober as of right now? What, you know, obviously it sounds like the crime and the drugs and it all was a, a kind of brokenness and seeking attention. What do you do now to stay? Or even in those first time going to county and second time and sobering up and cleaning up, what's your driving force now to stay sober and clean? I'm still fighting and battling at times, so... I'm still battling and fighting with the old me because there's times that we all fall sometimes. You know, it's just who we hang around with, the crowd. Mm-hmm. 
And a few months ago, like I said, I was drinking very heavy. And I know I knew that if I kept it up, I was going to lose everything. I worked so hard. So I'm still fighting right now. And what it is... Okay. I hate myself, and I can't forgive myself for the, all the, the horrible things I did to people and my kids. I want to say that, you know, first off... And I have to first love myself in order for me to mentally change what I'm still fighting and going through. Absolutely. 100%. And I just want to say, you know, we appreciate you, first off, for being able to share your story with us. But most definitely, first and foremost, you have to forgive yourself. And I you can't sometimes because I wasn't a mother to my kids. And I am so blessed to the kids that I have that they didn't follow my footsteps or their dad's footsteps. They're both in the military. Yeah, we had a lady actually last week. Amazing story, Yadira. She, uh, her dad murdered her mother and then her dad got remarried, murdered her mother and killed herself, killed himself. And for years, she spiraled down a path too of unforgiveness and shame because she thought all that was her fault. She didn't tell anybody and she just lived with this burden her whole life. And it's one of those things, you know, I'm sure Will has had a massive burden on his life and can regret things he's done in the past. I've done many things in the past I regret and come out to light and people have known and I've gotten shamed for. But, you know, the biggest thing is in order to love yourself, you got to forgive yourself. And if you can't forgive yourself, it's, you know, I mean, what did Jesus say? The two most important commandments are said, love the Lord your God yourself and then love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love someone else if you don't love yourself. I know. And, you know, God's forgiven you. So is Jesus, and it's just time to uh, embrace that, right? And that's going to allow you to move on in this. It's almost like you're in bondage, right? And as long as you're in bondage, you're going to be, you know, going around this, this broken cycle over and over in these battles. But when you learn to forgive yourself, there's this amazing freedom that comes from it. You know, and that's something a lot of our guests have experienced, and it's amazing. You know, and that's something we want you to experience because when you get that, it's like, boom, the light bulb goes on and your life's completely different. And now instead of coming from a place of shame, you're telling your story from a place of victory and you can help others, right? Because mm -hmm. you have an amazing story. Yeah. And what you've gone through, most people are never going to experience and can't even fathom. So you're going to be able to help a lot of people with your story. So you just got to remember, hey, this is my story. This, it is what it is that happened. You know, I've been forgiven. Yeah, I may have hurt people, but that's not who I am anymore. And now I'm going to help people because of my past. I just want to add on to that because, like you said, a lot of people haven't experienced what you experienced. They don't but understand. But a lot of people have experienced what you've mm -hmm. experienced. You know, and they're looking at you and they're hearing your story and they're seeing what you've accomplished now, which we'll get to, you know, later on. But you've accomplished so much, you know, She's and so they can out. see that and be like, man, I'm going through the same thing she was going through. And look at her now. And so they use you as they their catalyst for change you know so just forgive yourself i can't say that enough steven yeah. said it like you, you can't say it enough there was a book that i read um before it's called the four agreements i guess that's a free plug <laughs> yeah everybody <laughs> read know, that <laughs> but so if you read it you know internalize those words you know what I'm saying and one of those agreements as you know is forgive yourself you have to forgive well, yourself and the good thing I like your transparency right now, the fact that you are in this battle right now, it's real. You know, it's cool to have people on the show and like, oh, yeah, I'm great now. But the fact that you're going through it, that's even more relatable because there's so many yeah. people that are watching right now that are like, man, I don't want to forgive myself. Mm -hmm. I'm going with what she's going through. I'm trying to be good, but, you know, I just keep beating myself up. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. That's I mean, that just makes you so much more human and relatable. Right. Yeah. I mean, because we've all been there and it's good to know that you're in it. And it's good that we're going to, at least Will and I are going to get to witness you hopefully go through it, right? Oh, and on the other side, when that light bulb goes off, it's going to be an amazing transformation. I know. So keep, you're already keep doing amazing things. Yeah. You're already doing amazing things. What I need to stop doing is trying to get, what is it? Um, how do you say it? when When you're trying to get something from someone, like, yeah, you're doing good. Oh, or the right. affirmation. I'm trying to get affirmation from the wrong people. Mm -hmm. And... And I let those wrong people mentally break me and put me down. It's like you said, you were still, you would do all these crimes for the attention and you still see that And then that when someone calls me something, I will sit there and do what you're calling me mm -hmm. just to, and I, I need to stop that because I know how, what I'm capable of doing and how my anger will take me. 
mm-hmm. because I don't, I'm, I'm a type of person that I will call someone out and I'm very real and that's what always got me in trouble because I react towards stuff like that and I know I need to just back away and just, that's why I'm off social media right now mm-hmm. and that's why I just had to push myself away from certain things and I stopped drinking because I was doing crazy things because of my anger. And I had to stop. Um, social media was driving me crazy because I was seeing other people's lives, and I'm like, "What? They're all it's putting a perfect. Per- they're all putting a perfect yeah. picture <laughs> on my social media. I don't put perfect pictures. I'll tell it how it is. I'm a recovering drug addict. I used to shoot meth in my neck because I didn't care about my life. Right. I shot so much drugs in my system that I just wanted to die, and I wouldn't die. Mm. I got shot at. I got put in a trunk of a car, beat up by a lot of guys, and I didn't die. Everybody that was next to me were just drop, dropping, dying. And I was used to look up and say, why am I still here? I just lost three cousins last year. <laughs> because they told me how to stop using drugs because his heart, he had heart failure. No, he died. My other cousin was shot. My aunt lost three of her sons last year. And I had to bury another cousin that never did drugs because she was had she was diabetic, and she needed a kidney transfer. And I was trying to give her my kidney, but we're not we weren't matching, and she died. She was my older cousin. I had to get her ready for her funeral, mm-hmm. and I'm sitting there getting my cousin ready for her funeral, and I'm crying and say, "Wow, why am I still living the life I lived, and as much drugs I did? Why am I still walking?" But I know there's a purpose for my life. Mm. But I'm the type of person that Amen. I want to know why and why. Why am I here? But you know what? The only way I'm going to find why I'm here is keep living. Is keep living and let it come to you. That's right. And I'm the type of person that's like, I don't let things come to me. I like to get it now. And I need to be patient. That's why I think I got hurt. <laughs> I wanted to compete. No, lady, you need to be patient mentally fix yourself. So, I mean, I know what's right from wrong, but I always... Go to the bad stuff. Because that's just the way I was always raised. But that's... At least you have the self-awareness, though. I do. You know, that's self- what pisses me off. The self-awareness. That, that. You know, the cool thing, too, you know, like, God's got a plan for you. That's why I'm here. I don't know why. I don't know if it's fair. But at least I'm self-aware enough to know that as long as I'm here, I'm going to be yeah. fighting. I'm going to be living. I'm going to be learning. And that's just as important. It's, it's actually quite fascinating I mean, to see. I think it's fair. To see what he has planned for me. The fear? The fear. I know he has something very big planned for me. Something yeah. great. I dreamed it. Um, when I go to church, I have a gift. And I see a lot of visions. And when I see visions, they all happen. And mm-hmm. I saw myself in a vision. And I know he has a big plan for me, but I have fear. I have fear for people to sit there and say, Oh, she's all holier than thou. You know how people judge people. And I don't know, I should stop that because I should just let God do what he has to do with me. Because I know I will touch a lot of people. A lot of people. Yeah. You know, the one thing I've, a lot of pastors I know and a lot of people we've interviewed, like, sometimes the rougher the backstory, the the more people you're going to reach, right? The bigger the testimony. Yeah, exactly. The bigger the testimony, you're going to, more people are going to relate to you. So you can't be like, oh man, look at Roxy. Look at what she did. Now, how's she, how's she talking on the podcast right now? You know what she's done? No. I mean, cause we can both sit there. Oh, Will's a world of murder. You know, yeah, we could all sit there and be like, you'd have no, you're no one to talk, but that's the amazing part because that's when, like you said, you were in church. God gets the glory when he uses bums like us, right? You know, I'm not a great speaker. I, you know, I'm not either. Yeah. I'm surprised I'm not getting nervous or looking all <laughs> Exactly, but you're doing great. You're doing great. You know what I mean? So, I mean, one thing I've realized is, you know, it, Moses stuttered, uh, Paul had a thorn in the flesh, and, you know, he possibly was blind. Like, there's there's things that you learn that, like, God's going to God's gonna use you, and you know what? He's going to get the glory because he is using you, and that's what makes it even better. Like, if I can use someone like Roxy, if I can use someone like Will, I'm going to get the glory. And you're going to see the amazing things I'm going to do through their lives. So that's why I just keep you encouraged. I'm just going to continue to keep encouraging you to keep pressing on. Cause I know. I have my daughter right now. Going. She's really doing so good in church. We She lost her grandma that raised her last year of, of COVID. And she was a Christian woman. She was um, speaking at Chowchilla hmm. State Prison for Women. And she was a beautiful pastor to this, to the day, till she passed. 
that woman loved me no matter what and never judged me for be, failing and being a bad mom. She raised my kids to be who they are. And my daughter is just, she's going through something right now. And I am so blessed that she loves me and respects me because I sat there and told my kids that I didn't love them. I love drugs more than them. That's mm. why I wasn't in their life. That's what happens. I'm just so real, and I'm going to sit there and sugarcoat why I'm doing something. Oh, I'm doing it because I'm going through something. No, I'm doing it because I don't care about nobody but myself, and I'm selfish. That's why I did what I did. It was all about Roxy. Mm. And my daughter, to this day, she looks up to me, and it's so funny because I look up to my daughter. Mm. And she looks up to me that one day she came home. She goes, Mom, let me have a selfie of you. And I'm like, for what? And I'm like, okay, so I send her a selfie. She comes home, and she has an Aztec warrior tattooed on her forearm. And I go, oh, that's nice. She goes, look at it good. She had my face. <laughs> I go, is that me? She's like, yeah. I said, why? She goes, Mom, because I see you as a fighter or a warrior. Everything you've been through, you have came out of. And I sometimes don't feel I'm strong. I always feel like I'm very weak. But people see me strong, but I feel weak because I, inside I feel broken because I haven't fixed myself. But you and I'm tr- yourself. I'm trying to f- fix myself. And like I was really stressed out coming over here because mm-hmm. there's something I'm blocking, some trauma in my past that I just, I'm blocking it. I'm writing a book about my life. And I got stuck on chapter six. Because I was the cause of someone getting murdered. Because I sat there and flirted with the guy and he got he fell in love with me and he pulled out the gun and started shooting at my kid's dad. And he got it just it happened. And when we went out to when we saw him drop he went and I we flipped him over and I saw him take his last breath. Mm. And that's something I always have to live with because I took someone's son. Let me stop. No, you're okay. Right. You keep keep talking. Away, and that's something that I just can't forgive myself for. So I mean, the decisions of other people are not your fault. Exactly. So I mean, I let him know exactly. So I mean, you didn't pull the trigger. No, I didn't. You're not the but cause he, of someone's murder. There's no but. Yeah, yeah, there's no but. But someone, someone made a conscious choice out of their decision to do it. Whether you influenced it or not is not you. You did not commit the crime. You are not the reason for it. I mean, bad things happen. People make people. Everyone's responsible for their own individual decisions, right? So you can't sit there and be like, "Oh, I'm the reason it happened." I mean, you may have witnessed it, but you didn't do it. But that night, I should have died. Also, he shot five times towards us, and a bullet had a backpack. A bullet hole was through my backpack right here and if it wasn't for my shoes i was wearing with the big old platforms i had two bullets in there that's only one more sign that it has too many signs <laughs> how many signs do you need to see that you are here for a greater purpose yeah, yeah. that's when i was young i was only 17. Oh. i should have but i have to I had to go through what i had to go through mm-hmm. you know it's for a reason Everything is for a reason. That's one thing that I, I have definitely learned. If I don't know anything else, we're all here for a reason. Everything we've done is for a reason. The years I spent in prison, did I want to go to prison for 16 years? No. But I'm on the in, outside of it, and I'm like, yeah, that was for a reason. You know, because had I not done this, I wouldn't have met Stephen. I wouldn't. Have, we wouldn't have had this podcast. I wouldn't be here talking to you. You know, and you wouldn't be able to share your story with so many other people. Like so you said, walking over here, you wanna you wanna go into women's prisons and and reach people, and I'm like, oh, I got someone for you. I do. Everything happens for a reason. This meeting happened for a reason, right? I'm gonna set you up with that person, and hopefully, you can share your testimony and your battle with other women that are going through the same stuff, and they're gonna look up to you. You know, it's the cool thing. It's like I don't understand why, but you know, people look up to me, people look up to Will, they look up to you, and it's like, oh, you know, I'm just I'm just a regular human being that's struggling like everyone else. But your story is individually unique to you. Mm -hmm. And what your story is, is special. So we talked about a lot of trauma, a lot of tragic events. 
let's talk about some of the great things that's happening. Successes. Here. Some of these successes. One of the things is definitely your daughter, proud mother of a great daughter. But what about your business? What's going on? One of the great successful things is I, when I got out, I went straight to Ballast Academy to get... I've always loved to do hair since I was little. I used to cut my sister's hair and while she was asleep. So I literally just... I got on March of 2013. By May of 2013, I enrolled in Ballast Academy and trolleyed myself night classes and worked at a taco shop because that's the only job I could have gotten because of my record. And I did it. And... I wanted to break some tests because I was the girl driving the nice Hummers and the nice BMWs and stuff, but I was in a trolley with nothing. But my goal was I wanted to get a, a career, and I've always loved hair, and I was going to do it. And I graduated in 2014, and my dream was to one day teach at Bella's because I wanted to be like the educators that were teaching me. Hmm. After I graduated, I applied at Supercuts, worked there for nine years, managed three other salons, and then I went to a school and I was teaching during COVID, a school show that they were applying, so I went to go teach. And well, during that time I had applied at Bellas four times, but they wouldn't accept me because of my record. Mm. And they tried everything they can, the directors, but they still wouldn't accept me. Last year, the director reached out to me, she said, are you ready to teach at Bellas? Mm. I said, are you ready to accept my record because I'm over getting <laughs> depressed? <laughs> she goes, you're hired. Uh -huh. And right now, since January, I am teaching at the school where I was taught at. I finally got my own little studio. I was so scared of going on my own. I'm trying to work on getting my LLC, get my business going. Um, I've done a few movies. I worked in Hollywood. And I just love to do hair and teach and inspire. Sooner or later, I just want to have my own salon and not do hair, I just have girls doing hair there. But I just want to teach. Well, you see that? You see how like how she, she just she slid just, that in there. You no, know, like how she just lit up while talking about this. She looks completely different Man. now. She's just glowing, talking about her career. And Man, that's amazing. You, and you can tell that's what you're one of the many things that you're good at because you're like, I love hair, and you're just yeah. brightened up right now. Everybody could take my confidence in any other way, but they will never take my confidence on doing hair because I'm a badass. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Let them know. And then my daughter took after me. She's a barber. Okay. Uh -huh. So we have our little studio together. And I think it's like yesterday we were working together, and I'm like, never in my life would I think this, you know? And my daughter really looks up to me when I do hair. She goes, Mom, you're so good. Mom, how do you do that? I don't know. <laughs> it's just in me, and I just love doing hair. Right. Um, also, in 2013, um, I was going to the gym. I was running a lot when I got out because that's what I did right. in prison. I ran the yard in circles. They used to call me the hamster because <laughs> that's what used to make me like not stress, like running and running. And I used to just run, run, run. And I didn't associate with nobody because I was trying to go home. So I didn't click up with nobody. And um, I started working out a lot, but I was never, I always had body dysmorphia. So I met my coach because I used to cut his hair and he told me, let me train you. And I said, okay, so... He started training me six months later. He said he's putting me on stage. And I said, what? I was always insecure about myself, never wore a bikini and stuff. And he goes, you're going on stage. And I'm like, huh? Me on stage? I'm 43 years old. You're crazy. And Hooker Hill. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to say that. <laughs> and a bikini. No way. He goes, you're going on stage. And the first show I did was March of 2018. And it's funny because I paroled in March. And mm. I'm doing a show in March. And I'm like, I loved it. So, yeah, I did, I've done, like, six shows. Wow. Mm. In 2020, everybody was getting fat and stuff, and I competed. I did two shows. I placed second and qualified for nationals. Mm. And in Sacramento, I placed third and fourth. And I was supposed to do Masters USA, but we had a family issue, so I decided just not to compete because I know what happens. And I like to compete because that's the only time I feel good about myself because I did it. And it's a lot of structure you have to put yourself through. Right. And, you know, for the past year and a half, I kind of just lost myself. And I'm trying to get back into it. And then I was really doing good. And then I decided to just mess myself up. But it's for a reason. Yeah. It is for a reason. It wasn't my time yet. It's funny because you obviously you think you possibly have a torn hamstring right now. And, and I already want to go work out. Yeah, you're going to be sidelined. But, I mean, one thing when I tore my pec, it was like, all right, I just have to sit with myself. I can't say. And deal with my issues for now. 
I'll be, the gym will always be there. And you know, I don't regret it. I mean, it sucks. I had to get surgery and all that stuff, but it's probably one of the best things to happen. You know what my problem is? I'm going to get fat. So I'm just about to cross the board and go to TJ. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's my problem. Because like I said, I've always had body dysmorphia. Real quick. Steel? Yeah, I do. I still fight it. Real quick. You want to plug your studio while you're here? What's your studio that you and your my daughter studios, work at? My um, studio? Well, it's under, it's under Boston Beauties. We're in Hillcrest at the Hive. And it's a little studio in um, Hillcrest. But you guys can follow me on Glare underscore beauty. And I do everything. Now, are you hair or esthetician? You do it all? I do hair, color, Brazilian blowouts, extensions, men's cuts, weddings, photo shoots. I have a lot of fitness girls. And to all my fitness girls out there, I do stage makeup also. Uh-oh. Can you uh, do Will's hair? Oh, we could just get a... We could get a... We could get a little off the top. We could get a lace wag. Have you seen that what the men are doing? Uh-uh. No. <laughs> just happening. go your size and we'll put it in. We'll give you a thing. There you go. <laughs> Okay, man. So look, I love the smile that's on your face, but I don't know if you noticed this. She liked to slide that. I did a couple movies. I was in Hollywood. Like I just doing, did a movie premiere last. What you okay. doing? Movies and stuff. What's going on? I'm really connected with the producer. I mean, they're um they're really good short films. Okay. And um, it's I've done two with him, and I like it that he puts my name on the credits. I mean, it's nothing all big Hollywood stuff, doesn't but you matter. know what? It doesn't matter. It's more than what I did. Yes, and it's really fun, but. When I, I told him when I finished writing my book, I want to do a movie about my life. Mm. Wow. His movie's on Netflix right now. It's Professor Thompson, and I did makeup, and my name's right there. Bam. <laughs> and um, in June, we had the red carpet event for the movie that we did before COVID, and it's pretty... I like it. He's going to start filming again, so I'm probably going to be going up to LA and do some movies. Check makeup and stuff. It's pretty special. I got it. I get it. I don't care about the movie. I just care how the girls look on the screen. So I get all excited. I'm like, God, their makeup looks so good. (laughs) I did that. (laughs) Yeah. So that's, it was neat. I like, my dream is to go to LA and just do filming and stuff. But for some reason, I'm still here. I'm not done yet. Patience. Yes. So how's your current relationship with your, you have two kids, right? Yes. So it sounds like great relationship with your daughter, right? Or she at least looks up it's to you. It's really good and everything, but like I said, uh, for the past year, I have let her down a little bit, made some wrong choices, was drinking, going out a lot, hanging out with a bad circle. So I understand why she's been angry at me right now, because hmm. she's scared. She doesn't want to happen what's happened to the past to you. And because she knows me. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. And... It's like I'm rebuilding my friendship with her right now, my relationship with her, because it's just trust is gone. I made promises and promises a few months ago, and I would come home drunk. And she just wants me to, she's the only way I could ever help myself is I just start searching for God. We had, um, not to cut you, we had a guest before, and, you know, sometimes from what I'm hearing, there's a lot of built up trauma. Oh, my daughter and my son have a lot of trauma. And I'm not just not even just them. Like you're sitting in, in front of me, and I'm talking about you. You have a lot of built up trauma. And have you ever had the opportunity to talk to somebody about it? I started seeing a therapist, but I don't know. I think I I I know you have to go see a therapist to help you and stuff. But I don't want to sit there and talk to someone that has never been through what I've been through. They don't know. What I go, what, what, how, how it is, you know. I know they're very educated and stuff, and I know I need to go see a therapist. I started seeing one, and she prescribed me some meds and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I don't want to. I don't want to depend on meds. You don't want to just th- throw meds at the situation. I mean, yeah. what say me what? was prison, but I don't mm-hmm. want to go back to prison <laughs> right. and save myself. Yeah, let's. Prison. That's not a good. Uh, no. So you know, because I came out stronger than a rock, you know. And there's times I'm like, why can't I be that girl? Right. What I'm going through right now is nothing compared to what I went through in those three years alone. Didn't see my kids. My dad fighting cancer. You know, my grandma passing away. So, and I went through all that and I overcame it. And I came out like a rock with nothing, nothing. Like, not even a shirt. And now, this little battle I'm going through, why can't I get, why can't I pass the hump? Because I have to fix myself. I have to search God. I know that. That always tells me, too, like, for what I've noticed, it's always darkest before dawn. Like, if God's got something really big for you on the other side, 
The devil's going to do everything oh. and throw everything, every temptation, alcohol, drugs, bad relationships, toxicity, drama, injury. He's going to throw everything at you because he doesn't want you to get over the other side. And you got to have that self-awareness like, I know what I'm capable of. Like you said, you've had a vision, something big going on. But you got to realize the devil knows your vices. And, he and he's gonna keep, my yeah, he's gonna keep throwing them at you. It's almost like a test. You fail a test, you gotta take it again and again and again. So just realize that you are, it sounds like you have the self awareness that I'm not failing that test again. I got bigger things to accomplish. That's why I think I had to be here today to put that strength back in me. Hmm. And probably when this fail, you know, show, airs, who knows? He'll probably reach out to me. Yeah. What about your other kids? You want to brag about your other my kid? Do- my son, he's in the Army, and he's my little twin. <laughs> um, he just came down last week and went to a barbecue. And I was at a birthday party last week, and I called him, and I go, where are you at? Because I was, didn't want to go home on Lyft. And he goes, I'll be in San Diego like an hour. I go, can you pick me up? And he goes, are you drinking? I'm like, no, I told you I stopped drinking. Because if you're drunk, I'm not going to put up with you, and you could take a Lyft. Mm. That hurt me, but at the same time, I was like, whoa. Reality check. Whoa. And when he got, when he got there to get me, he goes, let me smell your breath. Mm. Whoa. <laughs> I, my son's just, he's the most sweetest person ever. And he he holds a lot of stuff inside like me. So, but yeah, he's doing so good. He's in the army. He, I think he's applied on his, he applied at a prison and he's, Doing his testing, and okay. I, he, I really haven't found out, but he applied and he was trying to get into San Diego PD, and he didn't get in. And it was so funny because he was filling out the application. He goes, "Jesus, mom and my mom and dad, damn!" He was like, "I had to fill all this stuff." He was asking me all these questions, I'm like, "Why?" And I, at first, I felt like, "Dang, my son's not gonna get this job because they're gonna judge him by whose parents are." Mm. But he went back to Fresno, and he's applied for, I believe, like two state prisons, and I think he got in in one. So. Uh-huh. That's awesome. Yeah, and he's going to be a sheriff. He wants to be a sheriff. Okay. So that's like, to me, it's like... <laughs> I'm like... You raised a sheriff after yeah. all this. After all of this. So yeah, it's like, it's like, I'm like... Yeah. I'm like, can we hang out or what? Yeah, instead of, <laughs> instead of, can I still be your mom? Instead of smelling your breath next time he picks up, he's going to be like, blow into this breathalyzer. <laughs> but yeah, I have two amazing kids. I'm so blessed that they're not in gangs. Living in Fresno, um, my daughter didn't have a bunch of kids or on drugs. So I'm really blessed. And that person I thank that for is the amazing mother-in-law that I had that never, ever judged me or put me down. And I was always... I was actually always her other daughter. To the day she ended up in the hospital, she would, I called her and said, what's going on, Harry? She goes, I'm not feeling too good. Mm. She goes, and I'm so proud of you. Mm. She goes, but I need to ask you a favor. She goes, because I don't think, I think it's time that I'm going home, Chana. They used to call, she used to call me Chana. I'm like, why, just don't say that. She goes, take care of my babies. Mm. Mm. When, her, when they on her funeral, her on her like service, her service was the most beautiful thing ever. She had twenty seven grandkids, wow. and every grandkid got a present. And every grandkid respect her, and every grandkid had to go to church. Mm-hmm. And her service was actually a service. And every grandkid, everybody went up there and was just saying so much amazing things. And I'm like, what is someone going to say about me if I continue drinking and going out to clubs and, you know, living with the way I'm living. They're going to be like, oh, yeah, my mom's fell again, you know. She still started doing what she just worked so hard. And I'm like, I need to change myself. That's when I contact Jess on IG when I was at the service. I said, Jess, something in my heart told me you need to mentor me. And I did her hair once. I didn't know Jess really. She goes, okay, I got you. And when I'm down, I message Jess, and she prays for me. The other day, I felt like I was going to have a mental breakdown. And I called her during lunch, and I said, I need you to pray for me right now because there's crazy things going through my head. I said, I just don't want to, I'm exhausted. I'm overworked. I feel like I could never get ahead. And she goes, okay, let's pray. So I know God put her in my life for a reason. I met you guys through Jess. 
It's good to have an accountability partner and someone that can. Oh yeah, she'll put me. You in You can place. be transparent with too, right? I mean, because a lot of us, when we're stumbling and messing up, don't have that. Like, oh, I really want to, really want to drink a beer. I really want to go out and do drugs. And I, I have buddies that call me too. They're like, Steven, there's this girl right now. I want to go outside. What should I do? I was like, let's hang out. He's like, ah, fine. <laughs> So, I mean, but that's good. Everyone needs that person in their life to really hold them accountable Definitely. and to keep them on the straight and narrow. You know, you wish you had someone like that probably 20 years ago, right? Mm-hmm. And Jess, she shows me pure, genuine love, something I've never received from a lot of friends. Yeah. Like the other day, I just messaged her out of nowhere um, when I came back home from the hospital and I go, I just want to tell you how much I love you and I'm so thankful for you. She goes, where did that come from? I don't know. <laughs> she goes well I love you too and you're, I'm so proud of you you'll be okay and I'm like okay and you know usually when you message that to certain people oh okay thanks Yeah. and those are the people I try to you know get validated validation from from the wrong people mm-hmm. Jess is the one that you need to be oh she's 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 my little angel those type of people your daughter Jess, the people that show you unconditional love that you just spoke of, and more so than anything, you have to validate yourself. That's where it all No one's ever going to validate you unless you validate yourself. Yeah. You're the only one that could pat yourself on the back. And I always want to get pat by other people, but how can I get pat by other people when their life is worse than mine? And exactly. they're just so judgmental. And when they're sitting there pointing fingers at you, I'm just laughing. I'm like, have you been through what I've been through? Right. You wouldn't even last. So it's just, those are the ones I want validation from. And Why? I'm hearing you say it, right? But at the same time, it's like, you, it. it's like you saying it out loud, but you're not internalizing it. That's why I had to be here. Internalize yeah. it. You know it. Because I had to hear it. myself through this. <laughs> yeah, if you have to, you know, watch this back every day, just to begin your day, then do that because you are an incredible woman. And yeah. I will go back on social media when this gets aired. And I'll probably, if I could probably put it on my. Oh, we got you. No. This is. This is what I've been doing. Yeah. Yeah. And you know what? There's knowledge and there's application. Mm -hmm. You can know it all you want, but you got to apply it to your life. And when you apply it through your life, everything you move and do and say is going to come from that place of application. Like if you know you're a great human, great person, great human being, you're going to act differently, right? It's like, you know, like I like to say, they're like, oh, I'm just a sinner saved by God. No, I'm not a sinner. I'm a child of God. And if I'm a child of God, I'm a child of the king, I'm going to act different because that's my dad. Yeah. Right? You know? So, I mean, you're going to act different if you believe those things versus just knowing those things. You got to apply those things. And what Will said is a great example. You know, you can know you can know it all you want, but let's start applying it. Up there. <laughs> yeah. You know, asking him for help, asking him for forgiveness, you know, asking him to lead, to take the will of your life. Yeah. But like me, I always want to be the one in charge. But I need to just, like you said, patience, sit down and just let him guide me and listen. Trust me. I know it's easier said than done. Yeah. We all, it's easier said than done practicing patience. But that's why it's called practice. Yeah. I, I know it sounds like you, I don't know if it's a patience or a control thing or a affirmation thing. You know, Maybe you, all of it. Yeah. When you go to the beach and you, know, you grab sand and you squeeze it really tight. And you open up your hand, and there's like no sand in there, right? But when you have your hand open, and you just scoop up the sand and let it flow, flow through you, you have a ton of sand in your hand, right? Every time you try to control and hold on and just grip it, there's going to be nothing there. But if you freely just kind of let it flow through, you're always going to have more. Just think about that. You know what I mean? That's the analogy I've been using lately. Deep stuff right there. Yeah, deep. Someone told me about that. They told me that about money. They're like, if you're always holding on, you're never going to have it. But if you just openly let it just flow through, it'll always be there. And, you know, it's been working for me. Yeah. But it comes from, like, giving. I'm I'm not afraid to just give because I live with an open hand. Yeah. Right? So, and even just every factor from you just trying to control all these things, just, you know, open your hands and let go. And uh, let I things flow. I need to let go. I just <laughs> let go. fly. <laughs> to let go, let it fly, and forgive yourself. I said it again. I'm keep on saying it. I'm gonna keep on saying it. Forgive yourself. We can't undo what was done. We can't change anything. We live moving forward. Mm-hmm. Life isn't lived looking back. So your daughter loves you. Move forward with that. You have a great friend and mentor in chess. Move forward with that. You have a great studio. You have a great job teaching Career. at the school that you was taught at. 
you know, one of your dreams coming home and you accomplish that dream. Move forward on that. You have so many things to look forward to, but yet you keep looking back. Oh, my God. You just tell me. Oh, I hear this every day from my daughter. <laughs> your daughter sounds yeah. like a very smart woman. And, then, and, I'm and now, now you're oh, going to... Oh, you, if you guys have her on here... Oh, <laughs> and now you're going to hear it from us. We wouldn't have had you on this podcast unless we thought you had some value to add to the audience out there. I was trying and to get you, out of it today, seriously. <laughs> That's what Will said. I was trying to make excuses. Will's, and when he said, well, we paid for this, Jimmy. <laughs> Will's like, Will's like, she's trying to get out of it right now. I was like, what? <laughs> One go, let you He's go. Like, you know why? <laughs> you know why I was trying to get out of it? <laughs> why is because that? I was letting the enemy exactly. control my mind. That's right. Fear. Yeah. Because he didn't want me to be here because he is scared of what this is going to be. Oh, yeah. Oh, what story. doors is going to open. What exactly. doors is going to open, the people you're going to help. They're like, no, no, yeah. we don't want you to share this story. Yeah. We don't want you to share that testimony. But you did. Yeah. And, you and I just, and also, I have an amazing four-year-old granddaughter. Uh-oh. Wow. So I always, like, I always regret because I was a good mom. But they, God gave me a granddaughter. My daughter, when she married her wife, she had a little girl and... They both raise her, and that's my little pride and joy. I'm like, I never sat in red books to my kids. I have never done, d- took my daughter to get her nails done. My granddaughter goes, Grandma, I need to get my nails done. <laughs> and my daughter goes, Mom, thanks for being so good to Peyton. Mm. And I'm like, that's my baby. So you're right. You know how you said I need to just, I can't make change the past. It's done. No. But I could just do better and make up for the past, what I have in front. Wonderful. And I have a granddaughter that, I'm going to do the things I didn't do for my kids. And it feels good because I have to have a lot of patience because I, with her, because she's just, she's just special. She's just amazing. And she's my little pride and joy. And I'm blessed to have that little girl in my life. You know what that's, you know what this reminds me of? Um, you speaking of your daughter and your, your children's grandmother and how much they meant to her and she meant to them. And now you have the same relationship. Same opportunity. And same opportunity with your granddaughter. And they're going to think of, she's going to think of you the same way your kids think of. Yeah. Their Grandma family. always loved me. She never judged me. She was always there for me. Now you have that opportunity to be someone that you looked up to for so many years. Yeah, because it's amazing. I mean, I mean she's not my blood granddaughter, but... That is my baby. That means nothing. <laughs> that means nothing. And that little girl, when she gets in trouble, she's like, Grandma, come get me. And I'm going to be right there. That's right. <laughs> and it's so cute because she, she, when she takes selfies, she does her face like me. <laughs> and my daughter one day posted on Facebook. She goes, oh, my God, you know she's been hanging out with my mom too much. <laughs> and it was the cutest thing I saw on Facebook because looking at her, I was like, wow. It's amazing seeing a little girl, you know acting like me and i love it so real quick in wrapping up while we're all still work in progress and you're still working work progress, progress but you've made a lot of progress is there any advice you'd like to give before we leave or anything you'd like to tell somebody or someone that possibly is going through what you're going through what would you want to share with them don't ever give up and like you said forgive yourself and i'm working on that um and let go of the guilt. Mm. Guilt will drain you and destroy you mentally. Mm. I mean, what you've done, you've done. There's no turning back, changing what you've done in life or who you hurt. As long as you ask that person or you've asked whoever you hurt forgiveness, you did what you had to do. If they don't want to forgive, it's because they need work in themselves. I know I've hurt a lot of people, and if a lot of people out there has hurt people, take that pride away and ask for forgiveness. Ask them to forgive you. And also forgive people that have hurt you. I forgive everybody that's hurt me. And I've asked everybody to forgive me for what I've done and everything I've done to them. So just that's the only way you can move on with the guilt. Guilt, me, doesn't really destroy me, but it did have me for a while. Because I couldn't, I was just so guilty for everything I did. Also, you know, since I'm on here, um, I am trying to find a publisher to write my book. I have everything, the rough draft of my book, and I want, I really don't like, I don't know where to start, but I do want to write a book, and it's going to be called Coming Out of the Darkness. I might have someone for you on that, too. And I'm not going to be done with that book until 
I get my IFBB Pro card. And if it's, it takes me till I'm 50 years old, then I got five more years to do it. There you go. Because my last page is going to be me incarcerated, and it's going to be me on stage with my Pro card. Because me, 50 years old, if you look at me when I was 30, I look way younger now. Hmm. Before great. we go, I just want to say one thing. And you said, ask for forgiveness. And I just want you to say that. To myself. I just want to forgive yourself. <laughs> but not only that, don't seek forgiveness from anyone else. That's not your your job is to apologize mm -hmm. and move from there because forgiveness may never come. So if you're seeking it, then you'll always be seeking it. And that's something that you'll always hold on to. And you'll you won't be able to forgive yourself. So you're you know, right. from me to you, don't seek forgiveness. Because forgiveness is not yours. Yeah, that's for them. Apologize and say you're sorry, but what and they do with it is, is not your responsibility. That's not your responsibility. And that's what I'm trying to seek right now, forgiveness from someone. And Don't it's not going to happen. Do not seek Have forgiveness. you already said sorry? Oh, you yeah. already apologized? Then, then that's it. That's your job is to just now pray for them and let it go. You know, because you've done your part. God's called us to forgive others, right? That we sinned against. And it sounds like you've already done your part. And you can't. You know, someone that I know is never going to forgive me for something I did, but I've apologized a hundred times over. And then I just, you know what? That's just how it is. You know, I made the mistake. I owned it. I apologized. Now I got to move forward. And yeah, that's true. Like my kids, um, he asked, he called me two years ago and asked me to forgive him. And I had been waiting for that for years. And it was the most amazing closure I've ever had for my ex, well, my ex-husband. Mm -hmm. And I forgave him. That's that's amazing. Yeah. And I mean, and it's very hard for a man to ask for forgiveness, you know, yeah, or to admit what they've done. But actually, it makes a it gives a woman closure, and we have more respect. Because I respect my kid's dad. Because what he did, it even took him ten years to ask me to forgive him and it, everything he's done. But I value that and I respect that. Right. So, we definitely appreciate you being here. We appreciate you sharing your story with us. Um, again, Roxy, you want to shout out where they can reach you at? Um, Roxy underscore D E Z. Um, and your studio and my studios, Glare underscore beauty. Glare underscore beauty. Thank you again. I'm Will. I'm Steven. And this, this is, is the Post, Post Pete Chronicles. Chronicles. Oh my God, I have no nails. Oh.